So I was streaming a short video in one of my classes recently, and it was interrupted by an ad for a product that is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. What caught my attention was the scientifically proven part. <laughs> what does that even mean, scientifically proven? Think about a time when someone tried to convince you to do or believe or buy something because it was proven scientifically. How did you feel? Did you feel engaged? Did you feel disengaged, indifferent? Whether or not we like science or identify with science, our, our lives are permeated with science in the form of news, advertising, medical advice, entertainment. Our society values science. That's why scientifically proven is such a powerful statement. Our science literacy is elevated as a goal of our public education. S science literacy should empower us to engage with science in public. See if this uh, is familiar to you as a definition of science literacy. Anyone should be able to understand science by applying critical thinking to the science facts and principles that we all learned in school. Easy. There's a growing disconnect, though, between this lofty definition of science literacy and our ability to publicly engage in science. And I believe that this disconnect arises because most of the science information aimed at the general public focuses mostly on the results of science, what the sciences, scientists measured, what their conclusions were, what the possible practical applications are. In science, though, it's systematic application of the process that matters, full stop. Science is not defined by who does the study, or by what we study, or even by what we learn. Science is defined by what we do. People do science. It's an activity. So we need a new definition of science literacy that empowers us to engage with science in the general public. This new, this new definition has to engage us in a deep appreciation for science as a process, not as a subject. How do, we, how do we recognize science when we see it? What makes a study scientific? The science teacher in me is obligated to mention the scientific method. <laughs> and I bet you could each list the steps in the scientific method from memory, or could at one time. <laughs> we start with a question about nature. We develop a hypothetical answer to that question, design an experiment to test our hypothesis, analyze the results, and report our conclusions about how that hypothesis matched the experimental test. Hand in the lab report. A plus, done, right? Not quite. Just like with many areas of our education, this introduction to the scientific method is just that, an introduction an idealized summary that's easy to use in a classroom or teaching laboratory. But the scientific method is more than that list. For one thing, it leaves out one of the most crucial elements of the scientific process, communication between scientists. Science involves deep communication between multiple groups of people. It involves an often lengthy and iterative process by which scientists refine their studies. So let's focus on science as it's really practiced. And this, di this diagram, this graphic from the University of California Museum of, of Paleontology summarizes the scientific process really well. And at first, it doesn't look anything like the scientific method. By the way, I'm not telling you that the scientific method you learned in school is wrong. It's just lacking a few details. 
But let's take a closer look. The parts of the scientific method that we listed are front and center in these four elements of the scientific process. It's all there. Exploration and discovery involves making initial observations, asking questions, noticing patterns, and it can be inspired by a fancy new scientific result that puzzles us, a new technology that makes more precise measurements easier. My current favorite is the James Webb Space Telescope or the need to solve a practical problem, or pure curiosity. Sometimes things are just wicked cool and we want to know more. Testing ideas is central to the scientific process, so it gets a big green bubble in the middle. <laughs> testing our ideas involves formulating hypotheses and then testing them through, through experiment and observation. A hypothesis is not a guess. A hypothesis is a proposed answer to the question about nature based on what we already know. And perhaps surprisingly, we don't seek to prove our hypothesis. In fact, I'll put it out there. Scientific proof is irrelevant. I say that as a committed science teacher and professional scientist. Analysis and feedback happens as a community, that communicating group. The community can be in a classroom, the scientific community, or the broad general public. Analysis and feedback involves uh, many elements but one of the most important is the development of our trust and our confidence in science. So scientists engage in peer review and they publish in scientific journals. This is a kind of reality check, quality control, and it can able, enable us to establish the scientists themselves and their work and develop trust in the people doing the communicating and crucially, develop confidence or develop, assess our level of confidence in the message that they're communicating, in the scientific results themselves, and we don't have to understand all of the details of the result. One big part of this analysis and feedback is the generation of scientific theories. In the context of science, a theory is not a suggestion based on logic, as it often is in common speech. A scientific theory is a comprehensive explanation, an explanation of what we're studying. It's based on multiple lines of independent experimentation or observation, evidence. Obviously, science results eventually in benefits and practical outcomes. Sometimes, and, and you can think of lots of examples, we don't always know what the benefits and outcomes are when we first complete a scientific study, but one of the very important benefits and outcomes is that we can address social and cultural issues from a new perspective. And it can inform social interaction and governmental policy, and here, is where the controversy usually arises. When scientific learning enables new technology that makes our lives more comfortable or allows us to overcome health issues, we love it. When it calls our belief or our behavior into question, we're not so thrilled. It's tempting to disregard it as just a theory. A hypothesis can be just a hypothesis, since it has yet to be fully tested, but a theory can never be just a theory, because a scientific theory has been verified by a convergence of multiple lines of experimental evidence. So, great diagram, I love that diagram. But what does scientific science really look like in practice? 
I have a couple of examples. Aside from being one of my favorite television shows, The Big Bang Theory is a comprehensive explanation and description of the origin and evolution of our universe. It's the most widely accepted scientific theory of cosmic origins by astronomers and physicists. But the Big Bang Theory development turned the scientific method on its head. And it exemplifies a really important part of science. The scientific process is not more technical than that original scientific method we all learned. It's not more complicated, it's more messy. And that messiness is essential, especially at the beginning of a scientific study. The Big Bang Theory started, the development of the theory as an idea, started in the early 20th century, around 1915, by community conversation on an entirely different theory, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Einstein and other scientists at the time suggested that the universe is infinite and static, unchanging. Then came a hypothesis published in 1927 by Georges Lemaitre. Using Einstein's theory of relativity, he calculated that in fact, Einstein, it should be expanding. And that means that the universe was much, much smaller in the past. And you've probably heard this idea as the Big Bang. Then comes testing the ideas, right? That's what we expect. But the observations that verified Lemaitre's hypothesis were designed for a completely different study. The question was, are galaxies nearby or are they far away? Nobody knew at the time. The answer, famously established by Edwin Hubble, who now has a space telescope named after him, is that the galaxies are very far away indeed. And not only that, they're moving farther and farther away. But Hubble did not identify this as evidence for an expanding universe. Some 20 years later, George Gamow suggested that if the universe had been very, very small in the past, it would have been hot and bright, and we should still see the light from that era now, but shifted into the radio part of the spectrum. In 1963, engineers at a brand new radio telescope that was designed to look for satellites, right? Cold War, 1963, had this faint radio signal coming from all directions in space. But they hadn't heard of Gamow's hypothesis. So they didn't understand their data as evidence for the Big Bang Theory. It wasn't until the 1970s that scientists finally put all of these pieces of evidence together and formulated the Big Bang Theory, a single, self-consistent theory of our cosmic origins. This exemplifies that messiness I was talking about that's essential to the scientific process. And scientific, our science literacy should embrace, needs to embrace that messiness from kindergarten forward. Okay, one more example, much shorter, and much closer to home. The COVID-19 pandemic exemplifies the relationship between science and technology and social interaction. All of us experienced the messiness at the beginning of the pandemic. We had questions. You know the questions. Should I be wiping down my groceries? How is the virus transmitted? Should we all be wearing masks? When will the vaccine be available? Will herd immunity work? Society turned to scientists with these life or death questions, and scientists responded as they always do at the beginning of an investigation, with recommendations based on what we already know about coronaviruses and a warning. This is a new virus, so we can't be 100% Sure, not the objective certainty that we wanted. We were scared. So discussion quickly turned in the news and on social media to who do we trust? If scientists don't know the answers, who does? Science and the scientific process couldn't move fast enough to keep up with the news cycle and social media. We lost faith in the process of science because we didn't understand the process of science. And that caused many to lose faith, faith in science itself. 
Science information and misinformation moves between our devices at the speed of light. So we need a new science literacy, that deep appreciation I talked about earlier for the process of science as it is actually practiced by scientists. This will enable us to assess science information and appreciate the work of scientists even when the results that they report require us to reevaluate our own perspectives and understanding. And what could be more empowering than that? Thank you.